Hi, guys, and welcome to Suffer the Little Children, a true crime podcast giving voices back to the victims of child abuse and shining a harsh spotlight on the parents, guardians, and caretakers who silence them. I'm your host, Lane, and this is episode 14, Charlotte Dawkins. On March 13, 2017, 21-year-old Travis Graham brought his girlfriend's three-year-old daughter, Charlotte Dawkins, to the emergency room, claiming she had fallen down the stairs while throwing a temper tantrum. Despite doctors' best efforts, Charlotte was pronounced dead the following day. Doctors told the family there were signs the little girl had been abused, including bruises and healing rib fractures. In spite of a cloud of suspicion hanging over Travis, he and Charlotte's mother were married less than a year later. In July of 2018, Travis was arrested for participating in several armed robberies, at which point he finally came clean about what happened to Charlotte on that horrible day 16 months before. Soon after, he was charged with the little girl's murder. This is the heartbreaking story of Charlotte Dawkins. My sources for today's episode are The Courier Post, Patch.com, NJ.com, Facebook, The Charlotte's Voice Facebook page, family members, and anonymous sources. Before I get started, I have a little business to attend to. First, it's worth mentioning that if I use the names of any children besides Charlotte in this story, it's with permission from the family. Second, this case is a lot more controversial than it would seem on the surface. Some of you may have seen that I posted a photo album for this episode on Saturday, as I usually do. And if you did, you also may have noticed the comment section explode with wholly unnecessary drama, thanks to one individual with an obvious agenda, but not much intelligent to say. I apologize if any of you were caught in the middle of that. He has since been blocked from the page. There are two very, very different sides to this story, and I'm going to deliver you the facts as I know them from major news sources and court documents, as well as direct quotes from people close to the investigation on both sides, some of whom agreed to be identified, others did not. I am trying very hard to present an unbiased account of the circumstances and events surrounding Charlotte's death. Once you've heard it, it will be up to you to decide if you believe one side more than the other. The most important thing here is that Charlotte is remembered, that she's properly honored, and that her story is told from the most authentic possible perspective. That's what I plan to do in this episode. I know for a fact that no matter what I say, it's going to anger someone, and I'll be honest, some of the feedback I've gotten already, either from my blog posts about Charlotte's case back in 2019, or just from the photo album this weekend, has made me think twice about even doing this episode. But you know what? I'm not letting anyone bully me out of telling this little girl's story. Charlotte James Dawkins means too much to too many people. Lastly, I just want to say that the whole Suffer the Little Children blog and podcast entity is a one-person operation. I'm not a reporter, a social worker, or an expert. I'm just a single mom with two kids of my own. I'm sitting here right now recording in my bedroom in a makeshift booth I created out of a shower curtain rod and a blanket. A few things converged to lead me to start the blog a little over a year ago. My love of children, my compulsive need to write, my habit of doing a frankly insane amount of research for everything I write, my fascination with the psychology of crime, and my desire to raise awareness of child abuse and give its victims back their voices. I hope that the work I've done so far has accomplished that. During quarantine, I've been able to devote myself full-time to the podcast and the blog. As of right now, Suffer the Little Children is very much a labor of love. I do it all myself, research, writing, recording, editing, mixing, mastering, artwork, publishing, distribution, you name it. I also pay for all of the costs involved in the show out of my pocket, including computer equipment, recording equipment, and that sort of thing. I also work ridiculous hours, days, nights, weekends, and holidays, just ask my kids, all so I can produce a new episode each week, in addition to writing blog posts as often as possible, bringing to light new cases, as well as providing frequent updates on stories I've already covered. In order to maintain the quality of the show, including in-depth research, sound equipment, and the ability to continue devoting myself full-time to the podcast and the blog, I am humbly asking for supporters willing to pledge whatever they can afford to help keep Suffer the Little Children a free weekly podcast and a robust true crime blog. To become a supporter, you can visit SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com and click Become a Patron. By making a monthly pledge, you will also receive rewards that vary depending on the amount pledged. If you're unable to donate monthly, I will also gratefully accept one-time donations via PayPal at sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. It's also a huge help to me when you subscribe to the podcast on your favorite listening app, as well as rating the show five stars and leaving a positive review. I'm not here to make enemies. 
I'm just here to speak for the children. Thank you to all of my listeners. I appreciate each and every one of you. Caitlin Marie Elizabeth Rose Royston was born on March 11, 1995, to then 20-year-old Renee Royston and 19-year-old James McEnany. James and Renee's relationship was short-lived, and James married another woman in 1996. Renee had a number of kids after that. By the time she married her current husband, Javier Rodriguez, in August of 2009, she had six kids of her own. Javier, who had three children when he married Renee, has been a supportive presence in Caitlin's life ever since. Renee and Javier now have two children together. Caitlin had several bonus parental figures and honorary siblings throughout her life. Her father, James, dated a woman named Michelle Eberly, and for a long time, even after they broke up, Caitlin called Michelle mom, and Michelle even has a tattoo of Caitlin's name. Michelle considered Caitlin her daughter, and her children used to call Caitlin their sister. Michelle's stepdaughter, Kirsten Myers, became one of Caitlin's closest friends, and the two considered themselves sisters. In 2012, Caitlin began dating a young man named Anthony Dawkins. Around the time she turned 18 in March of 2013, Caitlin and Anthony learned they were going to be parents. Charlotte James Dawkins was born on December 11, 2013 in Voorhees, New Jersey. She was given her middle name in honor of Caitlin's father. Charlotte was a gorgeous baby, born perfectly healthy at 6 pounds, 6 ounces, with a head full of brown hair that would quickly lighten to golden blonde. She was instantly adored by her large extended family as well as everyone who met her. Caitlin and Anthony's relationship was on again, off again until early 2014 when they broke up for good. Caitlin was 19 at the time. She and Anthony tried to stay on good terms for a while for Charlotte's sake, but things devolved to the point where Caitlin blocked Anthony and most of his friends on Facebook, but someone continued to take screenshots of her posts and share them with Anthony, who would then confront her about them. According to Caitlin in an email she sent me last year, Charlotte's biological father was never a part of her life, and she didn't even know who he was. For a little over two of Charlotte's three years, she and Caitlin lived with Caitlin's dad, James. This is a little sound clip of Charlotte playing in a princess tent at her granddad's house. Hello. Hello. The ladybug. Ta-da! Ta-da! Sometime around the late summer of 2016, Caitlin started dating someone new. His name was Travis Wayne Graham, and he was born on February 25, 1996, to Juliet and David Graham. He has three siblings, brothers named Christian, John, and Brad, as well as a son, Bentley, who was four when Travis and Caitlin met. The couple quickly became enamored with each other and swore they were going to spend their lives together. Almost immediately, Caitlin and Charlotte moved in with Travis, who lived in a townhome in the 1400 block of Bittersweet Drive in Blackwood, New Jersey, with his parents. This clip comes from a video of Travis, Bentley, and Charlotte building a gingerbread tree at Christmas time. Charlotte's tiny little voice might be the cutest thing you've ever heard. And you're going to put it right there. Right there? Yeah. Then I'm going to push it. Baby. You push it. Bentley. By January of 2017, Travis had proposed marriage to Caitlin, who accepted. Around the same time, Caitlin became pregnant with Travis's baby. Travis turned 21 in February. Caitlin turned 22 on March 11th. Two days later, her daughter, three-year-old Charlotte, was fatally injured. It wasn't long after Caitlin and Charlotte moved in with Travis before family and friends began noticing Charlotte turning up with injuries that either had no explanation or for which the explanation given just didn't cut it. For a couple of months, Travis's ex-girlfriend Chelsea and their son Bentley also lived in the home. In October of 2016, when Chelsea got married, she moved to New York State, where her new husband Blaze was stationed. Bentley stayed in New Jersey with Travis, and the plan was for Chelsea to take him back to New York with her at Christmas time. but when Travis was arrested in October, Bentley went to New York to live with his mom and her new husband. I spent way too long trying to find the reason for Travis's arrest in October of 2016, but the only thing I think it might have been for was a complaint issued against him in June in Bloomfield Township for harassment, a criminal offense in New Jersey under a statute that states, A person may not make communication in offensively coarse language or in any manner likely to cause annoyance or alarm. 
Anyway, after Travis was arrested in October, Bentley remained in New York with Chelsea and Blaze, other than court-ordered visits with Travis every third weekend, for which Travis would either pick Bentley up or meet Chelsea halfway. Chelsea said she witnessed a few things that, in retrospect, made her question Caitlin's parenting choices. She told me, Kate was very neglectful to Charlotte while I was there, leaving her downstairs with myself and Bentley while Travis and Kate stayed locked away in their room. I have also seen her put her hands on Charlotte. I understand the difference between abuse and discipline, and honestly, it didn't seem like just discipline to me. When she'd yell at her, she would use her thumb and pointer finger and squeeze Charlotte's cheeks together around her mouth, and sometimes leave bruises from squeezing so hard. I personally have never seen Travis lay his hands upon Charlotte when I was living there. She continued, They often left Charlotte with me or dropped her off to Renee's house to go do whatever they wanted to do. After I got married in October 2016, Travis, Kate, and Charlotte came to visit one weekend, stay with us, and I noticed Charlotte was very distant from her mother. This was about January 2017, also when Kate found out she was pregnant. The last time I ever seen Charlotte was March 12, 2017. Travis, Charlotte, and Juliet, Travis's mother, came to drop Bentley back off in New York. As they came in the house, she came running to my husband, yelling, Uncle Blaze! He picked her up and hugged her. At that moment, she started to cry and yell, Hurt, hurt, pointing at her belly. We asked what was wrong, and Juliet then said, We don't know. Kate said she fell off the bunk bed in their room. Mind you, Charlotte never climbed on the top bunk. She was actually very afraid of the top. So we gave her some snacks and juice to take on the ride back to New Jersey, and I remember Juliet and Travis saying, Let's go, Charlotte. Time to go back home and see Mommy, where she flipped out, saying, No, I no see Mommy. I stay here with Bentley. After the comments on the Facebook photo album blew up this weekend, Renee sent me several messages, one of which was referring to comments posted by both Chelsea and her husband Blaze. Renee said, Chelsea and Blaze would like nothing better than to see Kate suffer. A family member sent me a photo of the bottom of Charlotte's foot that she said was taken about a week before Charlotte's death, saying, This was taken before she died to where we started to piece together that something was going on, but Travis killed her before we could talk to Charlotte. Kate said it was a blister from her shoes being too small. The photo in question is included in the Facebook album I made for the episode. The family member said that to her, it looked like someone had intentionally burned Charlotte's foot. When I asked if anyone in the house smoked, I was told that both Travis and Caitlin did. On New Year's Day in 2014, Charlotte, who was not even a month old, was admitted to the hospital with a virus, and Caitlin, who was still dating Anthony at the time, decided to go home with him rather than spend the night in the hospital with her sick newborn. Renee expressed a negative opinion of the decision, including some concern that the New Jersey Division of Child Protection and Permanency, or DCPNP, would be called if at least one of the baby's parents didn't stay with her, at which point mother and daughter blew up at each other, with Renee threatening to call DCPNP herself and Caitlin going on a Facebook rant about her mother, referring to Renee with some highly offensive language. Caitlin also swore to her Facebook audience that she no longer had a mother and Charlotte no longer had a nene, despite the best attempts of her stepfather, Javier, to defuse the situation. He cut right to the bone with one statement. Do you, Kate. That's what you're good at. But no matter what, our house is always there for you and C-Web. Despite vowing that Renee was dead to her, a week later, Caitlin was back on speaking terms with her mother again. Some of their off periods lasted a matter of days. Other times they would go months without speaking. That was what happened in the weeks prior to Charlotte's death. Renee told NJ.com that she spent a lot of time with her granddaughter until January of 2017 when she noticed a bruise Charlotte had suffered. When Renee confronted Caitlin with this information and threatened to call DCP and P, Caitlin cut off all contact with her mother. During the time that Renee was not allowed to see her granddaughter, Anthony Dawkins, Charlotte's father, said he was prepared to go to court to fight for Renee to have visitation with his daughter. He said Caitlin had been keeping Charlotte from him as well, despite his attempts to see her. In Caitlin's emails to me last year, she explained, He started asking to spend time with her about a week or two before she died and just wanted to take her overnight out of nowhere. I told him he could start with spending a few hours with her with me there until she was comfortable, then move on to having her for the day until she was comfortable, then take her overnights after that, and he didn't want to do it that way, so I told him no. Renee's last contact with Charlotte was on January 18, 2017. The next time she saw her granddaughter, Charlotte was in a hospital bed, motionless, unresponsive, on life support. On March 13, 2017, Travis was home alone with his girlfriend's daughter when Charlotte received an injury that would prove fatal. 
When Travis initially spoke to police, he claimed that after Charlotte cracked the screen of her iPad, he told her to go to bed. As she headed upstairs toward her bedroom, he overheard her start to fall down the stairs, but Prince Charming that he is, he was able to catch her before she hit the bottom. Travis told investigators that after her tumble down the steps, Charlotte was upset for about 30 minutes before she fell asleep. According to him, when he later tried unsuccessfully to wake her from her nap, he noticed traces of blood on her mouth. He claimed he attempted to perform CPR on Charlotte before he drove her to Jefferson Stratford Hospital. Charlotte was airlifted from there to Cooper University Hospital in Camden, where doctors in the pediatric intensive care unit found her pupils fixed and dilated, indicating a brain injury. They also discovered multiple healing rib fractures and bruises on her forehead, chest, abdomen, and legs. Several times, Charlotte went into cardiac arrest, and she was diagnosed with a severe traumatic brain injury. A physician's evaluation concluded that the history, physical examination, and diagnostic studies are diagnostic of child physical abuse to a medical degree of certainty. A family member described Charlotte's injuries to me by saying, Every one of her ribs were broken and healing. She had eight bruises on her chest, four together, then a space, then another four, that looked like fingertip marks that were different shades of healing. She had a perfect circle burn on her right side, perhaps from a cigarette burn. Doctors believe Charlotte's ribs had been broken at different times since the fractures were in different stages of healing. They told members of the family that Charlotte had walked around with broken ribs for at least a week with no medical attention. Some family members stood outside the door to Charlotte's hospital room and overheard a conversation between medical staff and Caitlin and Travis, during which doctors said Charlotte's fatal injury was caused by some type of abuse, referencing her broken ribs. Immediately afterward, a family member told me, Kate came out of that room and lied right to us, told us that her injuries added up to her falling down the steps. Soon after, she left and never returned to that baby. Once the doctors told Caitlin that Charlotte had no brain activity, she agreed to donate her daughter's organs. Then she signed medical authority over to Charlotte's godmother, Kirsten, which meant that Kirsten, at 20 years of age, would be in charge of any medical decisions that had to be made on Charlotte's behalf. As soon as that was done, Caitlin, accompanied by Travis, left the hospital, never to return. Charlotte James Dawkins was legally pronounced dead at 4.14 p.m. on March 14, 2017. On the Charlotte's Voice Facebook page, Kirsten described the experience. On March 14, 2017, we sat in Cooper PICU waiting for you to pull through this. To this day, it breaks my heart to say that wasn't the outcome. On March 14, 2017, we sat in that room and listened to a doctor say this was no accident and it was caused by the last person she was with. In that moment, we soon figured out that you weren't the only one who would be facing a fight. Although Caitlin had placed her mother on the restricted list, telling hospital personnel that Renee was not allowed to see Charlotte, another family member managed to sneak her in to allow her to see her granddaughter for the last time. Because Charlotte's organs were to be donated, she wasn't removed from life support until a few days later. Kirsten faithfully sat by Charlotte's bedside, holding her hands, kissing her, talking to her, and absorbing every remaining moment she had with her beloved goddaughter until the time came to remove Charlotte from life support. Kirsten wrote on the Charlotte's voice page, You really are a superhero, babe. We chose to fight for you because we knew something wasn't right about this. We chose to keep living after you took your last breath, which was one of the hardest things we've ever done. We chose to be Charlotte's voice. The medical examiner's office initially ruled the manner of Charlotte's death undetermined, but it would not remain that way. Authorities began investigating, and their focus fell squarely on Travis Graham. Despite the dubious circumstances surrounding Charlotte's death and Travis's suspected involvement, Caitlin continued to defend him, at times butting heads with her mother and other family members, over her support of the man her family felt had murdered her daughter. Michelle Eberly said, I wanted answers from her from the start, and she couldn't or wouldn't answer them. That's why we stopped talking. I wanted to know why she was still there. She left a few times right after Charlotte died, but always went back to him then just began losing more and more of her family. For a time, that included her mother. At some point after Charlotte's death, Renee posted a pair of photos on Facebook showing Charlotte in Caitlin's arms, saying, This is one of my favorite pictures. I know she is watching over her mommy and keeping her safe, something Kate should have done for her daughter. In October, Caitlin posted a photo of herself with Charlotte as an infant along with a bitter caption. My baby girl. My angel baby. Mommy loves you so much, and I'm so sorry people are just now showing that they care when you're not here anymore. They missed out on knowing the amazing person you'll always be in my heart. I will always love you more than anything in this world. 
On October 10, 2017, about seven months after Charlotte's death, Caitlin gave birth to a baby girl who was removed from the young couple's custody and placed in Kirsten's care, where she remains to this day. James told me, I have not spoke to Kate after she told DCP and P I was a raging drinker and the baby was not safe in my care. I had to pay to be evaluated by an outside source about my drinking. James, who says he never drank while Charlotte's baby sister was in his care, was ultimately deemed not to have a drinking problem. In February of 2018, Caitlin Royston and Travis Graham were married. Throughout the first half of 2018, Travis spent a good deal of time on his two favorite hobbies, heroin use and armed robbery to fund his heroin use. He was ultimately arrested in July of 2018 and accused of robberies in several New Jersey counties. Among other incidents, he was accused of robbing a Pantry One store with an airsoft gun all the way back on February 3rd of 2017, prior to Charlotte's death, of driving the getaway car on January 24th, 2018, while an accomplice robbed a deli with an airsoft gun, and of robbing the same deli himself while wielding a knife on June 27th. While being detained on charges of taking part in five separate armed robberies, Travis confessed to taking part in the crimes, saying he was so high on Xanax and heroin that his memories of the incidents were foggy. When police asked about his drug use, Travis explained, I just wanted to forget a lot of stuff. He mentioned Charlotte's death as part of the stuff he wanted to forget. He also made statements to the detectives that contradicted his original account of the day of Charlotte's fatal injury. Travis told investigators that while he and Charlotte stood at the top of the stairs, Charlotte, who was refusing to take a nap, pinched him. In retaliation, this six-foot, 160-pound coward backhanded the tiny three-year-old girl in the forehead with so much force that she spun around and fell face-first down the stairs, where she lay unresponsive. He claimed she had wet herself, so he changed her clothing and took her to the hospital, he said, five minutes after the incident. However, text messages between himself and Caitlin on the afternoon of March 13th indicate he actually waited three hours before he walked into the emergency room carrying Charlotte's lifeless body, according to the probable cause statement for his arrest. At 12.38 p.m., he texted Caitlin, Char just threw a hissy fit and dropped dead weight while walking up the stairs. I caught her, but she banged her head. At 1.35 p.m., he wrote, Her head is pretty bad with bruises. And at 3.26 p.m., he texted, Going to emergency room. Travis's ex-girlfriend, Chelsea, told me that Caitlin's side of that text conversation wasn't mentioned in the news, saying, She's the one who told Travis to lay her down for a nap. She did not seem like a concerned mother, in my opinion. Chelsea added, She was using someone else's phone, telling him to put her down for a nap. It was Kate texting and calling him, just not from her phone. When I asked why she thought Caitlin would do that, Chelsea replied, She knew exactly what she was doing. The Camden County Prosecutor's Office investigated Charlotte's death for a long 16 months. But in July of 2018, prosecutors finally announced they anticipated filing charges against 23-year-old Travis Graham in the death of 3-year-old Charlotte James Dawkins. Renee told NJ.com that as this was announced in court, her husband Javier couldn't resist clapping a few times inside the somber courtroom. Prosecutors had to wait for a report from the medical examiner who at last ruled Charlotte's death a homicide caused by blunt force trauma to the head in early August of 2018. On August 14th, Travis was charged with first-degree murder as well as a charge of endangering the welfare of a child which, according to the criminal complaint, stemmed from Travis failing to seek timely medical treatment for Charlotte's obviously serious injuries. After Travis was charged, DCP&P investigators ruled that Caitlin Graham also bore some responsibility for her daughter's murder because she did not make reasonable efforts to protect her child. Prosecutors declined to charge Caitlin in connection with Charlotte's death. Renee explained to me via email that this was because Caitlin was at work when the incident occurred. A family member said of Caitlin, She defended him until he basically confessed, and even after that, continued to talk to him when he was in jail. She isn't the same Kate that I knew and loved, that's for sure. In March of 2019, Caitlin posted a birthday fundraiser on Facebook. We've all seen these things. Instead of asking for gifts, people request that their friends donate to a cause that matters to them. Caitlin's chosen organization last year was Strong Prison Wives and Families Incorporated, a 501c3 nonprofit organization dedicated to enhancing the lives of inmate supporters through programs designed to provide empowerment, education, and support. Family members were quick to react. One Facebook post read, Your husband is in prison and part of the reason you don't have a family. I said part of the reason because you are to blame as well due to your neglect. Your husband is in prison for countless robberies you knew were taking place and for confessing to your daughter's murder. You still choose to stand by him and now you're asking people to help support that? 
For someone who's afraid of clowns, you sure are full of jokes. Caitlin removed the fundraiser soon afterward. In April of 2019, prior to one of many court hearings the family endured during their long quest for justice for Charlotte, Renee posted the following on Facebook, pointed directly at Travis, who had been behind bars since the previous summer. Ten days till we see your smug face in court again. Ten days till we find out if you own up to what you did or not. Ten days till we get to hear the judge make a trial date or not. Ten days. Ten days too long, but I will be praying and staying strong for Nene's baby. You and your wife are just disgusting, and I am so ashamed to say I'm related in any way to either of you. Charlotte James, Nene will forever be in your corner. With several articles being published about Charlotte's case, Caitlin was evidently trying to demand news stations remove her daughter's photo from the online articles. Renee posted this on May 19, 2019. Nice try, Kate. Her face will be plastered all over the place. Everyone will see her beautiful face and remember her. You can choose to forget her, but none of us will. We will always, always fight for her. Charlotte's voice will forever be heard. Two days later, Renee made another post which read, I do not get satisfaction out of sharing these articles about Travis, but I share them and contribute to them so everyone knows what happened to Nene's baby, hoping and praying it will wake up another mother and get her and her child to safety. I share because it is my guilt and my burden to bear that I couldn't save one of the most precious gifts God shared with me. Everyone can share them and say nasty things about him, but I want everyone to remember her name, not his. Charlotte James, that is the name of Nene's baby. Today has been a rough one, and the night brings even tougher times, but I will continue to fight for her and pray that his name gets forgotten. Travis was offered a plea deal in May of 2019 in which he was offered a 40-year sentence in exchange for guilty pleas to both the murder charges and the charges related to his five armed robberies. Travis's attorney countered with the suggestion that he spend only 15 years in prison, a ridiculous offer that the state immediately refused. Failing that, Travis expressed his desire to be tried for the crimes, for which he faced possible life in prison. However, on Friday, June 28th, Travis accepted a second plea deal, giving some measure of justice to Charlotte's family and sparing them the horror of sitting through a trial. As part of the deal, Travis pleaded guilty to a reduced charge of aggravated manslaughter and three counts of conspiracy to commit armed robbery, thereby admitting he caused Charlotte's death. On July 1st, Kirsten posted the following statement on the Charlotte's Voice Facebook page in response to an NJ.com article about Travis's plea agreement. Never in a million years did I ever imagine I'd be reading news articles that were updating the justice of your murder. Every single picture in this article, there's a memory behind it for me. The one on the left, you're cuddling me on your third birthday while we're both wearing pink sweatshirts eating McDonald's for dinner. The one on the right, you're in your Ninja Turtle shirt sitting on my desk at work and you came to visit me the day before my birthday and continuously saying happy birthday even though we kept trying to tell you it wasn't until tomorrow. The last picture, you're in your so-so nightgown, cuddling me at the hospital because you had a yucky virus and threw up all down me. I still remember you trying to clean it up, really just rubbing it in more and saying, My sorry, tear. I know justice is what we've been fighting for, but just because we're getting it doesn't make this any easier. I'd much rather be reading everyone's fun statuses about you and what you'd be doing and how you'd be spending your summer, but not everything in life goes the way you want it to. Please know we will continue to fight until the very end, babe. Your name will never be forgotten. Thank you for being my best friend and being my best three years. I love you so much, little babe. A lot of people wonder why Caitlin would stay with Travis and even marry him after what happened to Charlotte. To help answer those questions, I will quote directly from email messages I've received from both Caitlin and Renee regarding Caitlin's relationship with Travis. First, the following is from an email exchange between myself and Caitlin Graham in July of 2019. In Caitlin's own words, I had no idea anything was happening with Travis and Charlotte. She never showed signs of being scared of him or anything. I got daily Snapchats of them playing or laying on the couch watching movies. She was at the doctor's two weeks before she was killed and all they said was that she had asthma. Travis was never violent with me or the kids until after Charlotte died. She was obsessed with him, only he was allowed to put her to bed, paint her nails, or make her food. She wouldn't let me. She only wanted him. So I had no idea. I went through hell, and I am still going through hell. Travis is the reason I've left a hospital twice without my daughters. He had me brainwashed. He wasn't some stranger. He was once a good man, and I'm not sure what turned him into a monster, but we have zero contact, and I'm working on getting a divorce. I now live with anxiety, depression, and PTSD, and without my girls. I've been in therapy and working to fix my life from all the damage Travis did, make my life better for my other daughter. Renee Rodriguez also emailed me almost immediately after my first blog post came out last July. 
The following are her words to me from that exchange. I'm tired of everyone bashing my daughter. No one knows the hell she was living. No one. I seen the bruises and the busted lips, and there were others in that house. They didn't live alone. They lived with his parents. In fact, his mother was there that morning. Kate was at work. Everyone knew he was using. Even after all this happened, his baby mama even let his son spend time with him because none of them thought he was guilty. Look, Travis wasn't a stranger. I watched this kid grow up. No one expected this or even thought this was possible. He was great with his son. In more recent Facebook messages from Renee, she reiterated, Kate was scared to death of that boy, and no one sees that. To save herself and the new baby, she did what she had to. In regard to allegations of prior abuse of Charlotte, Renee said, No one saw any bruises on her before she died, and a lot of people saw her. Her granddad had just had her for the weekend and didn't see them. So to think Kate knew is nuts. She didn't. Kier was there at the hospital when the most horrific scream came out of my daughter when they told her about her baby. She collapsed in Kier's arms, but no one wants to tell that side. On July 26, 2019, family, friends, and supporters gathered in a courtroom in Camden, New Jersey, to witness the sentencing of 23-year-old Travis Wayne Graham. Under the terms of the plea agreement, Superior Court Judge Gwendolyn Blue sentenced Travis to 30 years in state prison for Charlotte's death and for his three robbery charges. Under the terms of New Jersey's No Early Release Act, Travis must serve at least 85% of each sentence, which means he will spend a minimum of 25 years in prison. Here's hoping the parole board laughs him out of the room when that time eventually comes. As Travis entered the courtroom, he glanced at the video screen displaying a photo of Charlotte and just as quickly averted his gaze. While a 15-minute slideshow of photos from Charlotte's short life played on screen, Travis stared resolutely at the table in front of him. The baby-killing piece of shit couldn't even stand to look at the face of the little girl he murdered. Assistant Camden County Prosecutor Christine Shaw described photos of Charlotte in the hospital. The photographs from Cooper University Hospital that were taken during Charlotte's uh, short stay, they are brutal to look at. As Charlotte's family had to see with their own eyes, and as her godmother described, that adorable, happy face that we all just watched on the screen for the last 15 minutes was, um, it was just so bruised and so swollen that she was almost unrecognizable. And the way that you would know it was her was from all the curly blonde hair poking out. Before the sentencing, the court heard several poignant victim impact statements. Several supporters wore t-shirts bearing slogans such as Charlotte's voice and justice for Charlotte, as well as photos of her smiling face. Many family members were in tears throughout the proceeding. Michelle Eberly, Kirsten's former stepmother and a close family friend, spoke in front of the court. Today this courtroom is filled with family, some that share DNA, many that do not. We are all here because of one little girl, Charlotte James Dawkins. She considered every one of us her family in some sort of way. The day she was born, she turned us into grandparents, uncles, aunts, godparents, cousins. The list goes on and on. My name is Michelle, and on that day, I became Charlotte's Mimi. Charlotte filled not only my life, but also my stepdaughter Kirsten's and my son's lives with so many happy and funny moments. She would truly light up a room with her personality and beautiful little face. I will forever treasure every moment that we all got to spend together. Now let's just focus on one day out of the three years we had with her. The day I got the phone call that changed our lives forever. I rushed to Cooper Hospital hoping to find my firstborn granddaughter in a condition she would recover from. Except it was the complete opposite. I spent the next few days standing beside her, holding her hand, rubbing her little feet. Kissing every part of her body that I could as I watched the truth of what really happened to her unfold. It was a true nightmare that will be embedded in my mind forever. Overhearing conversations from doctors stating there was a lot of abuse and that someone had caused it. Some coward. The same coward that if I had known would have never entered my home. Interacted with my children, ate at my table, or ever been offered a place to rest his head when Charlotte and her mother came to visit. Since March 13, 2017, my life, my life and the lives of my children will never be the same. We not only lost Charlotte that day, but our relationship with Caitlin as well. For myself as an adult, 
I struggle every single day trying to comprehend how all of this could have happened. I also experienced true heartache and pain trying to explain this to my children. It's indescribable and there truly are no words for it. Right now, at this moment, my promise is to keep her memory alive, to stand proud, proud that I am her Mimi, proud that she got to help other families by donating her, donating her organs, proud that she has a huge family that loves her and stood together to finally get justice for Charlotte. Most of all, I am proud of my little family. Kirsten has stepped up and become a huge role model to Charlotte's little sister. The day she graduates college, she will throw her cap in the air, in the air yelling, ta-da, in memory of her. My son Christopher's first tattoo is Charlotte's name with a little tear in remembrance of the true princess she was. When Seth hits a home run in baseball, he rounds first base, kisses his fingers, and points them to the sky. It's crazy, after his most recent home run, a rainbow appeared in the sky even before his foot touched him plate. Cole has a picture of her inside his phone case to make sure she is always with him. Jameson, even though only eight months old when she was killed, has somehow become a fan of all of the, thing, all of the things she liked, especially Batman. My point in all these little stories is that this coward may have taken the physical, present, and future tense of Charlotte away from us, but it, he cannot take away our memories. He cannot take away our little ways of keeping her with us. He can, however, finally take responsibi responsibility and plead guilty to what he did to my granddaughter. Thank you for giving me the opportunity today to support Charlotte's voice. Charlotte's grandfather, James McEnany, listed in his statement the various milestones Charlotte's loved ones would never see Charlotte reach. Your Honor, on this day, we await justice for Charlotte James. So much has been taken from this family and my daughter. From my daughter, he took her firstborn, her best friend, and her life. From this family, he took a ladybug, a little babe, a granddaughter, a niece, a best friend, and a cousin. Her name was an honor that was given to me because I have no sons. This is an honor that can only be done once. Him spending his life in a cell will not compare to the pain we will feel every December for her birthday and Christmas. The first day of school that we will never get to see, a prom dress that will never be bought. Our first crush her mom will not get to giggle about. Halloween costumes that will never be bought and a confirmation that will never be celebrated. The graduation that her mother won't get to cry about while telling her how proud she is. Driving lessons that won't be taught. A first car that she won't drive to college. A wedding day that won't be celebrated. I will never get to meet my first great grandchild from my first grandchild, from my first child. These are the scars he has left on the hearts of everyone that has loved my granddaughter, my ladybug, when he chose to do what he did that day. Some wish him peace and forgiveness, and that is their right. I, however, hope he sees her little face in his dreams and he hears her giggles when he is alone, and it causes him to lose sleep and gives him no peace. From what he has taken, for me, he has taken my ladybug and my daughter. And in the end, when he stands before God, he will be holding her hand as judgment is handed to him. Charlotte's grandmother, Renee Rodriguez, offered a heartrending statement. Today I was going to start off with, today is a hard day. But we all know today is a hard day. Today we get some kind of justice for our baby. So let me start off by telling you a little bit about Charlotte. Because, after all, this is why we are here today. Charlotte James was the glue that kept our family together. She was the first grandchild and had a special bond with so many people. Charlotte was born on December 11, 2013, during a snowstorm. She was born on her due date, such a rarity. She was so calm and just took in everything around her. Charlotte James was taken from us on March 14, 2017, during a snowstorm. She left this earth the same way she entered it, with an abundance of love. 
Charlotte had a laugh that made everyone around her laugh. It was so infectious you couldn't help yourself. Her whole face would light up and she would have this twinkle in her eye. She had the most head, intense head popping hugs. She wanted you to feel the love all the way down to your toes. Charlotte James had so many names. For me, she was Nene's baby. For Arwello, she was his sea web. For Granddad, she was his ladybug. And there were so many more and she knew every single one of them. When Charlotte came into my house, the first person she looked for was her TT. See, Marisol is only three years older than Charlotte was. TT was one of her very favorite people. Then she would go down the list, JJ, who was only 22 months older, and then she would look for all of her aunts and uncles. Her Uncle Bubba, T. Anthony, Aunt Becca, Aunt Mimi, Aunt Holly, and T. Mamu. Then when she got to the bottom of the list, she would look for her most favorite, her Willow. See, my husband would work nights and so I had to sleep during the day. So Charlotte would climb the stairs in search of her Willow. She knew he was sleeping, but she didn't care. She would burst into his room and yell with confidence because she knew he would be excited to see her. Oh, well, oh, I'm here. She would climb up in bed and give him kisses and hugs. He would return all of the love. They had a special bond and a love for jalapeno Pringles. Charlotte, Marisol, and JJ were more close than any of us could be. They were all, almost the same age. Everything we did was always ask, is Charlie coming too? She was her little sidekick. Christmas portraits they had done every year together, the little three amigos. It has been extremely hard on them since her passing. They don't understand what happened and why she's not here with them. But now, as they get older, Maris almost nine and JJ seven, it's not so easy to brush it under the carpet with excuses anymore. How do I explain to them that their favorite person was taken in someone else's hands on purpose? I'm confident in saying that every person in this room all have different feelings about Travis. Charlotte was Nini's baby and I hurt every single day knowing she's not here, but I am confident in knowing that she is in a place that I will see her little sassy, beautiful face again one day. I know not one person in this room wants to hear the words healing or forgiveness. I am a woman in faith, and everyone knows that. Forgiveness is for the person that hurts, not the one that caused the pain. To try and forgive someone that has hurt someone you love so badly and destroyed your entire family seems impossible. Our family has been destroyed to say the least. We all have <coughs> pointed fingers at who was to blame and who wasn't. The only person to blame is Travis. I am not in control of any of that and what happened, but I am in control of my own feelings, whether others agree or not. I've had this conversation with the people that I love and I respect that they are nowhere near I am. I forgive. I have no other choice. I will not allow anyone to have that kind of power over my emotions and how I feel. Forgiveness is for the one giving it, not for the recipient. I don't want to live the rest of my life full of hatred. I love Charlotte with everything in me. And I know how much she loved everyone. Didn't matter if she knew you for a whole three years or just met you a few minutes ago. I choose to leave this courtroom knowing that she has some kind of justice, but also leave with love and forgiveness in my heart. Charlotte will forever live in my heart and my memories. Just because I choose to forgive doesn't mean that I don't want the appropriate justice for Nini's baby. Justice must be served and served swiftly. I just choose not to dwell on the pain and the anguish that this has caused so many of us, and especially Charlotte. She should be here living her best life, growing up with her sister and making friends and beautiful memories with her family, but she's not here. He has taken all of that from her. I know a lot of people will say, but I lost this and I lost that, but we all have lost so much, but not nearly as much as Charlotte has lost. So I do feel that his sentence should fit his crime. Charlotte's godmother, Kirsten Myers, poured her heart out in front of the courtroom, and her words were powerful and touching. I won't lie, I've been pushing off writing this statement for a few reasons. One being that I know when I write this, it will mean that we are finally here. We're finally in court facing the boy who murdered an innocent little girl named Charlotte, which will make this nightmare feel even more real than it already does. The second reason being, how do I put in the words what you've done to our family, what you've done to me, and what you've done to Charlotte? Lastly, where do I even begin? Someone told me that in order to, to move on, you have to forgive. But I don't know if those people who say that are... People who have ever had to forgive someone who wasn't even remotely sorry for what they did. Something so permanent that an apology won't fix and not even a life sentence could fix it. The truth behind these words and the visions that may come with them is the product of some people's poor choices and behavior. I know with this statement many people said to talk about the good and to share the memories of Charlotte, but I already have my own way of doing that. For me to begin healing, I need some people in this courtroom to hear what this family has truly been through. Not everyone in this room deserves to hear the good or relive the memories, but to hear the damage that they've caused. 
We're not in this courtroom for a good reasoning. We're here because an innocent life was taken and that won't be forgotten because it simply can't be. Charlotte Dobson is, is way too recognizable. However, my faith is strong and I believe that for me to begin to forgive that starts right here, right now with this statement. I know some of these words may sound cruel to the ear, but this is our reality. There have been multiple nights when I've sat down with my notebook and pencil and swore tonight would be the night that I'd write this statement. The flashbacks from the hospital would start playing and I'd become, it'd become too much. So I put my notebook down and reassure myself that I would do this another night when I'm stronger. The next time I tried writing, I figured I would type my statement so that I could get the words out quicker and that it wouldn't take as long to write the memories, the good and the bad. But do I start with the happy times? Do I share the memory of the first time Charlotte the first time I met Charlotte in the hospital, just a few hours old, wrapped in a little blanket to keep warm, or do I start with the last time? The issue with that is that I can't figure out which counts as the last time. Was it the time in the hospital with the bruises showing, the freshened black eye, her head wrapped in bandages, the uncovered burns and the heating blankets on her to keep her body temperature up so her organs would stay viable for donation? Or is it at her funeral when her skin was now cold to the touch while wearing her pretty Easter dress? Her and her mom picked out, but she wore early because she didn't get to see the day it was intended for. Her funeral where her hair was out of the bandages and washed and curled and the burns were covered by clothing and the bruises were poorly covered with makeup. How about I start with Charlotte taking her first steps to me, or maybe the time when she ran back into my work because she needed to hug and kiss me just one more time. But little did I know, those would be the last steps she would ever take towards me. The anger towards you is very much there, accompanied by hatred for what you've done to an innocent three-year-old. Disappointment for the time they narcaned you just in time, because why should you get to be saved when Charlotte couldn't be? The regret is there, which I always thought came from the day you walked into Charlotte's life. But if it weren't for those two other innocent lives you brought into this world, the true regret would be for Sunday, February 25th, 1996, which is the day you came into this world. Someone like you doesn't deserve a happy life when you intend to take exactly that from the innocent. When I have to talk about what you've done to my family, I can't help but feel my heart skip a beat. Again, where do I start? Do I start with the amount of people who've been diagnosed with depression? Maybe the anxiety because at least we have daily medicine and onset medicines to help with the, heart, the attacks that come with it. When we start to think about what you did to Charlotte or when the thought of living forever without Charlotte hits like a ton of bricks. Maybe I can try to explain the PTSD. There's nothing like walking into the hospital that I hope to one day work at. Instead, become a place where nightmares happen. When every hallway I walk down, there's a memory. When I'm in the ER, I can see myself running through the metal detector to get to Charlotte. I can still hear the alarms going off that my purse set off. I still remember the kind security guard who came out and picked my purse up off the ground and grabbed my jacket from the floor and anything else I might have thrown off my body in desperate attempts to get inside to the hospital. Once that guard brought me through the door, he did his best to calm me down so I could get the words out that my niece was being brought here due to a quote-unquote stair fall. Within moments, you and your fiancé walked into the ER, and the images of your clothing are burned into my head. Your tan work boots, gray sweatpants, and white shirt that had light blue paisley designs on it. I think your outfit sticks with me the most because your shirt was covered in Charlotte's blood. I remember waiting in the ER, waiting for her helicopter to land when finally over the loudspeaker. We heard there was an incoming trauma on the helipad which meant Charlotte had arrived, or should I say Charlotte's body. We started making the calls to our relatives, and rather quickly the ER was filled with familiar faces. For what seemed like an eternity, we were finally brought up to the family waiting room, where a doctor came in to tell us the final update. He started with, I'm sorry, but there's no easy way to put this, or any way for me to sugarcoat it. But this is where we talk about organ donation or pulling the plug. It was silent. I still haven't figured out if the silence was from everyone trying to catch their breath, if everyone was crying too hard to make a sound, or if the silence came from my entire world stopping. My guess is it's a mixture of the three. I remember seeing Charlotte in the PICU for the first time and collapsing on her bed, with the nurse rubbing my back to help me catch my breath. After spending time in the room with Charlotte, I walked right up to you, and I asked, I asked you to walk me through your entire day, and you responded with the word, why? I simply told you, that I needed to understand why she looks that way. You told me a story, one of your many stories, might I add, not realizing that you've made some changes to it from when you've told me it earlier in the evening. I knew right then and there that this was your doing. 
As the time went on, I watched as detectives lined up to go into Charlotte's room, and doctors and nurses tried to comfort us while still supporting Charlotte. When I see the chapel, I remember sitting in there with her granddad and begging God for a miracle, willing to make any promise if he could just heal her and let her survive this, even offering to switch places with her. When I see the elevators, I think of how many times I walked in and out of them to go up to her room and how I waited outside of those elevators to meet Detective McGuire so that he could interview me. The images are endless. On the following day, Tuesday, March 14th at 4.14 p.m., Charlotte was pronounced dead and she gained her wings. About two to two and a half hours later, you left the hospital after Charlotte's mom told her she was leaving me in her place. I stayed with Charlotte until Thursday, March 16th until around 4 a.m. when they had taken her to the OR to start her organ donation. The things I witnessed in those four days will forever haunt me. Me and you have done things in life that people should never do, especially at such a young age. You killed an innocent little girl, and I, I stayed and held her hand while they measured the bruises on her body and took countless pictures. I rubbed her face and talked to her while they performed a rape kit on her. I watched as they pumped her body with things to keep her stable, and as they put gel in her eyes to keep them preserved for her autopsy. You chose to deal with your choices by pumping your body with drugs and continuing to make poor decisions, while I chose to start grief therapy immediately and work on getting better so that I could be who my nieces need me to be. I need to be strong enough so that I can be Charlotte's voice. I need to be strong enough so that I can be the person that other innocent children need me to be. I refer to you as a boy and I will never refer to you as a man because you are the furthest thing from that. I've said these exact words before and this time I will gladly get to say them again and I get to say them to you. I'm sure you've all read an article by now how Travis confessed to backhanding a three-year-old with such force she spun and fell face first down a flight of steps. This quote-unquote man felt that was okay because during his argument with a three-year-old she supposedly pinched him. In what world does a man handle a child in this way? Someone who was trusted to keep her safe, protect her from bad people, only to be the person she was in the most danger with. For you putting your hands on an innocent, full of life little girl was not only wrong, but it was selfish. <coughs> you robbed her of an entire life she was barely given the chance to experience. And you robbed us, her family, of getting to watch her grow up. We will never watch her wave goodbye to us on her first day of school, and we will never <coughs> teach her how to ride a bike. She will never experience the Tooth Fairy. We'll never get to watch her win the big game or competition for whatever sport she would have played. We will never help her pick out prom dresses. We will never watch her walk across stage to receive that diploma she would have worked so hard for. We'll never get to help her decide on a career, and we'll never get to watch her grow up, fall in love, get married, or become a mother. We will never be able to watch what her life would have become because of you and your cowardly actions. You were the furthest thing from a man. You, Travis Graham, are a coward. When you took Charlotte's life, you also took a huge piece of mine. I'm sure many can relate when I say that your first niece or nephew will always hold a special part of your heart. They're the closest thing you have to having your own child. Sometimes if you're really lucky, they come out just like you. One moment you're a carefree teenager doing your own thing, and the next thing you know, you're an aunt or uncle to this little tiny person who consumes the biggest piece of your heart. A piece so big that it makes you realize that you've never loved someone like this before. A piece of your heart so big you would never willingly give to someone because you know that if anything ever happened to that person, you would struggle to ever be okay again. At the time, you don't even bother to put up a fight to protect your heart because it's theirs before you even have time to realize it. When there's a sudden twist in fate, your entire world shifts. When that twist that knocks the wind out of you happens to be a phone call from your sister that will forever change your life, you will then and only then understand true love and true heartbreak. True excitement is when you find out you're going to become an aunt or uncle. True love is when you see that baby for the first time and lock eyes and know that it's you two against the world. In that exact moment, you know that this child will forever be your best friend and that you will always have their back. As that child starts to grow up, you will realize that you unknowingly vowed to never abide by bedtime and that just one more cookie isn't really as big of a deal as their parent makes it out to be or that 10 more minutes be playing before bath time isn't too much to ask for. You somehow became this little person's sidekick, partner in crime, best friend, and their attorney, and most importantly, one of their favorite people in the entire world. Lastly, true heartbreak is when that child is ripped from this world, when that child is ripped away from you by a coward who lacks self-control, when all you can do is sit beside that child's bed hospital bedside until their final minutes and hold that baby's hand, rub their belly one last time, and reassure them that they are loved and apologize countless times for not knowing that someone was hurting them. When you're kissing both of their cheeks, their little nose, both of their tiny hands, 
counting all ten fingers and running your thumb over their eyelashes. And when you hold their hand flat against your face, since that tiny hand will never reach out for your touch again, all while the machine is breathing for them, that is when you experience true heartbreak. I've read that when writing your statement, you can express, express opinions or give suggestions to the judge as to what you feel would be a fair sentence for, your, for the inmate. Your Honor, I would love nothing more than to see this boy serve the rest of his life in prison. Why should he have the chance to ever live a happy life when Charlotte never will? Respectfully and truthfully, no amount of time will ever be enough to pay for what he did. However, Travis, whatever your sentencing is, I hope that you don't find comfort for the slightest second by thinking that your life wasting away will ever make up for taking Charlotte's life away. I want you to know and to fully understand that your life wasting away doesn't justify your actions of taking a life by any means. When this journey is over and the hearings are finished and the final court date has been held, I will leave this courtroom with justice for Charlotte. We all will. We will live without fear of the future because you're locked away and you can't hurt anyone else. Charlotte's name is listed 31 times in this statement because her name deserves to be held. It's allowed to be spoken and Charlotte will not be forgotten. And lastly, I will leave here forever being Charlotte's voice. Judge Blue offered consolation to Charlotte's loved ones. I've never met Charlotte, but I almost feel like um, I know a lot about this little girl who I haven't met and the effect that she had on everybody. And everybody don't have that ability to make other people feel special <laughs> or to find good in everyone. And it sounds like Charlotte was given that gift of making everyone feel good about themselves. We all given jobs when we we're born, and Charlotte certainly has served her job well. That ability that some adults can't do to find good in others and to make others feel good about themselves and to make others happy. And she brought a bundle of joy to everyone who touched her. And she certainly brought a bundle of joy where you get this many people in my courtroom. And for me to see this many people with a little girl who lived a short life, but a huge life, when I think about the impact she had, I do say that that speak volumes about who Charlotte was because I feel like I know something about who Charlotte is. And that's before I even see pictures of her. I can picture this personality of this little girl. Near the end of the lengthy court proceeding, Judge Blue took notice of Travis's attitude. I've listened or attempted to listen if there was anything Mr. Graham had to say. Mr. Graham is silent. I note he certainly has not shown this court any remorse for his conduct that this event even happened. I note that he looks stone-faced as he looks at the court to hear his sentence. And I have to say that I see nothing that suggests to this court that he's remorseful, that this event happened. Travis's attorney, Richard Sparacco, told the court that Travis had accepted responsibility for all of the charges against him. There is not much good that they can, can be said about a case like this. Uh, my client, Travis, has accepted responsibility for all four cases, but in particular with regard to Charlotte's case, he's accepted the responsibility for his actions. The only thing that is good about this plea agreement is that we have avoided a protracted and what would be uh, an extremely painful trial uh, for the family members and extended family of Charlotte. Renee had this to say when I asked her last year if she thought Travis's sentence was adequate. Absolutely not. He destroyed our entire family. He should be in that prison for the rest of his life. Caitlin added, He took away my entire world and deserves the same done to him. Soon after Charlotte's death, Travis and his ex-girlfriend, Chelsea, went to court where Travis granted her full custody of Bentley, who just celebrated his eighth birthday last week. Happy birthday, Bentley! Caitlin is still legally married to Travis and still using his last name. In August of 2019, Renee posted a group of photos of Caitlin on Facebook along with the caption, I love you, Caitlin Marie Royston. Caitlin responded by telling her mother that wasn't her name, so Renee changed her post to read instead, Caitlin Marie Graham. As I mentioned earlier, Charlotte's little sister is still in Kirsten's care. The little girl is just about two and a half and is reportedly doing well. She definitely got her big sister's angelic looks and beautiful blonde curls. I have a ton of respect for Kirsten, who's only 23, and yet she's committed the last three years of her life, not only to getting justice for Charlotte, but also to providing Charlotte's baby sister with more love, nurturing, and care than some people give their biological children. According to Caitlin's father, James, his daughter is still very much reliant on her mother, with whom she is back on good terms. The case with DCPMP, James said, is ongoing. 
When I asked him if he thought Charlotte's younger sister would be reunited with her mother, he said, The division is trying to push that way because they just want the case to go away, and we know how the last turns out for the kids. He added, Nothing is changing the minds of the division, and my fear is burying a second grandchild. As we near the end of this episode, I want to set the controversy aside and take some time to remember Charlotte James Dawkins as the sparkling little superhero she was during her three years on Earth. Charlotte was, as Renee described her, tiny, but she was mighty and so lovable. She had many nicknames. Renee called her Nene's baby, and her husband, Javier, called Charlotte Sea Web. Her granddad, James, called her his ladybug. Kirsten called her Little Babe. Others called her Charlie, Little Popsicle, and Charlie Bear. Her vast extended family doted on her. She adored both princesses and superheroes. And there are lots of pictures of Charlotte wearing outfits that combine the two themes, like a Batman t-shirt with a tutu or a Ninja Turtles t-shirt with a giant bow in her hair. Her nene told NJ.com, She was fun-loving. If you met her, you fell in love with her in a minute. Renee added, She liked tiaras, but she liked to dress up like Batman. Everyone who met her loved her. Charlotte's favorite song, according to Caitlin, was You Are My Sunshine. Charlotte loved to watch any princess-related movie or TV show. Renee told me, Her favorite show used to be Sophia the First, but she grew out of that. She loved anything to do with princesses. She loved anything sparkly and girly, but loved to dress up as superheroes and loved Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. When I asked about Charlotte's personality, Renee replied, Oh, where do I start? She was the most loving little girl. Never had to even raise your voice to her. She was the light to our world. She was so sassy at times, and we all laughed at it and just loved her sassy side. Caitlin added, She was an absolute ray of sunshine with a heart of gold and an independent spirit. She was sassy beyond belief, which was always my favorite part. Caitlin told me she doesn't want Charlotte to become the face of child abuse, explaining, She was so much more than how her life ended. She was the brightest part of my life, and I'll always have a piece missing. I will honor her by telling her sister about her always. That's the biggest honor I can think of, is her sister knowing every detail so she feels like she knew Charlotte for her whole life. For her part, Renee said, I personally plan to just share her pictures and her videos. I miss her laugh and smile so much. We will make sure that her sister feels like she never misses out on having Charlotte by her side growing up. When I asked Renee for her favorite memories of her granddaughter, she said, My favorite is when she would run in the house and give me one of her head-popping hugs, and when she would climb the steps in search of her abuelo, yelling, Abuelo, I'm here! Caitlin told me, My absolute favorite memory will always be the first time I looked into my beautiful baby girl's eyes for the first time. Some of Charlotte's other family and friends shared with me their favorite memories of Charlotte as well. Travis's ex-girlfriend, Chelsea, said, Charlotte was a beautiful little girl full of giggles that were contagious. She gave the warmest hugs you could imagine. I still remember her running through the front door yelling, Uncle Blaze, and jumping into his arms. She was full of life and loved to cuddle with me and Bentley, eating goldfish and watching movies. We miss her so much and would do anything to have them moments back with her. Travis and Chelsea's son, Bentley, said, I miss Charlotte. I miss playing with her. I remember me and Mimi got her her first shooter. It was pink and she loved it. We ran around the house playing with them. Chelsea sent me a video clip of Bentley and his Mimi, Travis's mom, Juliet, giving Charlotte her toy gun. That's your surprise. Your gun. What is that? Your first gun. My your first, first gun. Yep. I can't open it. Oh, I'll help. I'll help you with that. Whoa, what? <laughs> it's my own shoulder. Yep, it's yours. Yeah, I can't shoot. Isn't this your best day of your life? Oh, I Be careful, Chad. I'll show you how to shoot. Do this. Oh, how do you shoot this? Oh, like that. Oh, uh, try. And I'll try. Michelle Eberly, who Charlotte called her Mimi, told me, I spent so much time with her, so to pick just one good memory is so hard. One that will forever hold a huge part of my heart is after my son Jameson was born. He was eight months old when she was killed. She crawled up into bed as I was feeding him and asked to help. I gave her the bottle to hold, and she looked at him and sung the whole entire song of You Are My Sunshine to him. She was just so proud. All of my children, including Kirsten, got to be involved in her short life. To watch them all completely adore her will always hold dear to my heart as well. Kirsten, Charlotte's Aunt Tear, recounted the following story. 
One of my favorite memories is the bond I had and will always have with Charlotte. It's indescribable. I'm not sure who would be more excited when one of us would walk into a room and see each other. We couldn't get to each other fast enough. I will always miss those little arms wrapping around me, her laugh, her excitement over the simplest things, and the way she could never pronounce my name, so to her I was Aunt Tear. Then I soon became Tear to a lot of my family. It's really the little things that end up being your best memories. However, my best memory of Charlotte will always be her entire existence. Charlotte's granddad, James McEnany, provided me with this recording. You asked for a memory of Charlotte, and there are so many. My fondest memories of Charlotte are sitting in a recliner, watching TV, and taking a nap. And hearing her say granddad, or her little laugh, there's so many memories. Charlotte's obituary read, Charlotte was a princess in her own world. She was so smart and had an out-of-this-world personality. She could light up the room with her smile and cared so much about other people. She's a soul that no one will ever forget. That's why we're here, guys. We can never forget Charlotte's beautiful presence and sweet smile. She deserved so much more than a mere three years on this planet. Right now, Charlotte should be six years old, finishing kindergarten, and spending every spare moment with her now two-and-a-half-year-old sister. Every child I write about on the blog or cover on the podcast has a piece of my heart, but Charlotte's story in particular has affected me deeply. My sincerest appreciation to the many people who loved Charlotte for sharing with me their photos and their memories of their little ray of sunshine who shone on this earth so briefly but so brightly that her impact will never be forgotten. Rest in peace, Charlotte. That's it for this week, guys. Join me next week for another case. Please subscribe to Suffer the Little Children on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast listening app. You can also subscribe on YouTube by searching Suffer the Little Children Podcast. Visit the website at SufferTheLittleChildrenPod.com where you can listen to episodes, leave a voicemail, and become a patron for rewards ranging from a shout-out by name on the show to exclusive show merch. Follow me on Facebook, Instagram, Pinterest, and Tumblr at Suffer the Little Children Pod, and on Twitter at STLC Pod. I've posted a photo album for today's case on Facebook and Instagram. Email tips, comments, questions, or case suggestions to sufferthelittlechildren.pod at gmail.com. You can also read about today's case as well as many others at sufferthelittlechildrenblog.com. This podcast was written and produced by Lane. Music and sound effects for the show were created using sounds from audiojungle.com. Always remember, hug your babies a bit closer tonight. Until next week, bye guys.